like a beacon rising up in the heart of the city, lifting spirits, serving their aspirations, and bringing reality to their ideals. A beacon made brighter by gathering together many sources of light, a series of small universities, individual colleges, each with its own special character and academic emphasis that combined guide our path forward. Avoiding the usual barriers between graduate and undergraduate students, fostering interdisciplinary studies and tearing down departmental walls, championing connection and collaboration. Imagine that, an edge that isn't. We didn't begin as an undergraduate college, then develop professional schools but started with graduate teaching and research in the beginning, laying the roof first. So we could attract top scholars and researchers right from the start. And you know what? They came. Among its purposes, the university champions the finest scholarship of the past and seeks through research the knowledge to guide our steps into the future. Guided and inspired by our founders, we're a university founded on the edge and we continue to thrive on the edge of tomorrow. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Pradeep Khosla, Chancellor of UC San Diego, and welcome to our evening of non-conventional wisdom. Part of being an inclusive and diverse university means that students can see themselves on our campus and in our faculty. We have blazed trails by working to increase women faculty and leadership at UC San Diego for many years now. We have worked hard to create a framework of support and inclusion for women across our university. Women like Nobel Prize winner and physicist Maria Mayer, for whom Mayer Hall is named. And since 2014, the number of women in ladder rank faculty and teaching professors at UC San Diego has increased by 37%, while the overall faculty size has grown only by 17%, and we call this disproportionate hiring. Half of all our deans and four out of seven college provosts are UC, at UC San Diego are women. And today, in our staff, women occupy 52% of management and senior professional roles, and 63% of all senior leadership roles. And this is what we call disproportionate hiring. So this evening, we are exploring the journeys of some of our leading faculty, are leading researchers, physicians, and alumni who also happen to be women. And there was a time when women in STEM were the exception, but at UC San Diego, they are beginning to be the rule now. And I'm proud to say that we have so many faculty who represent the future of this field. Our students benefit from their rich experience and from their rich backgrounds. Our university, for example, is the first in the nation for enrolling and graduating the most women in the US in STEM fields. And this is a point of pride for us. Our panelists tonight are pushing boundaries in their fields like UC San Diego founders did 60 years ago. They're removing barriers for those who will follow. Our executive vice chancellor of, of academic affairs, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons has been a champion for diversity among our faculty and in the field of physics. So I'm very pleased to introduce her as the moderator of this evening's event. She's an example of bold leadership that is transforming her field and our university. So let's learn a little bit more about Dr. Elizabeth Simmons. It's always been interesting to see that strangers never quite believe that I'm a physicist or that I'm a particle physicist. And you know, the startled looks are great because it's just not, it's not what people are expecting. I was always really interested in science and math Math in particular, but I didn't want to do pure mathematics. I wanted to do something that applied to the real world. You know, there's, there's a yearning among people to understand the origins of the universe. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And particle physics deals with the earliest moments of the universe. What existed right after the Big Bang? And how did we get from there to now? It all has to do with what fundamental particles exist, how they interact, how they used to interact, is it different now? I think that some of the most interesting things still left to discover are actually additional particles and forces that we have never yet seen. Things at the very smallest scales of the universe. 
I was very lucky that my thesis advisor, Howard Georgi, was a big advocate for diversity and equality in physics. Back when I was his student, I think about half of his students were women, and that was at a time when there were very few women students at all. And so he was somebody who actively supported us. He took our ideas seriously, and he treated us with respect. He would argue with us about physics. He wanted to collaborate with us, write papers with us, just like he did his other students. And that was tremendously important. One of the things that really excited me about coming to UC San Diego is that there is such a strong group in um, particle theory and particle experiment. There are people who work all the way from designing big experiments, thinking about how to analyze the data, all the way through the model builders like myself to people doing very theoretical abstract work. So to have the whole spectrum of expertise here that you can talk with and collaborate with is really exceptional. One of the best parts of my role here as uh, the chief academic officer of the university is getting to think at the big scale about how we're serving our students, how we're helping make sure that they are able to feel welcomed into the university, belong at the university, and how they can make progress through their degrees in a way that all of them can do it no matter where they're starting from. We want them all to be able to get to the point of successfully graduating with the major that really they are passionate about. And so I love being able to pull together people from different parts of the university and work collectively on these issues that impact our students. One of the things that really gives me hope is uh, seeing how many of my colleagues in particle physics are now doing outreach to the next generation and seeing how diverse the group of graduate students and postdocs is now. As that generation goes out to do outreach to high schools, there are going to be so many young kids from all racial and ethnic and sexual orientation and d different backgrounds of every kind who will see themselves in those who are trying to talk to them about particle physics and feel welcome and feel, I can, I can be them, I can be her, I can do this. And that's really exciting for me. Wow, extremely impressive. Elizabeth, I'm honored to call you a friend and a trusted colleague. And our faculty and students, I think are extremely proud and fortunate to have you as one of their leaders. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you and from all of our panelists who are all very impressive people. So let me just say, lead the way, Dr. Simmons, it's yours. Thank you very much, Chancellor Kosla, for that kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to join you in hosting this evening of non-conventional wisdom focused on women in STEM. As noted in my video introduction, I'm a physicist, I am a woman, and I am deeply passionate about equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the climate for underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and math. As part of tonight's program, we'll share some brief video interviews with each of our panelists, followed by live Q&A. Audience members are also welcome to submit questions in the chat box throughout the event, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my esteemed fellow Tritons serving as our panelists. Michelle Bautista Layton is a UC San Diego alumna currently pursuing her graduate degree in nanoengineering from the Jacobs School of Engineering. She's also an avid surfer and an advocate for women and underrepresented minorities in engineering. Anika Nawar Ulla is also a UC San Diego alumna, having earned her bachelor's degree in human biology. She is also a National Geographic explorer, Fulbright research scholar, multimedia artist, and global health activist, pursuing her graduate degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Lab. Dr. Olivia Greve is another UC San Diego alumna and currently a professor in our mechanical and aerospace engineering department, as well as director of the Cali Baja Center for Resilient Materials and Systems. She has gained international recognition for her work in nanomaterials manufacturing and was the very first Latina engineering professor hired at UC San Diego. Her impressive history of championing, championing collaboration in STEM fields and also mentoring underrepresented students has been recognized by numerous awards. Dr. Pradita Ghosh 
is a professor in the departments of medicine and cellular and molecular medicine. She's also director of the Center for Network Medicine and the founding co-director of the Humanoid Center of Research Excellence. She's an active mentor to undergraduates, pre-doctoral students, and postdoctoral associates, and still spends about 10% of her weekly time providing clinical services. Dr. Kip Poliano is a professor of molecular biology and the very first female dean of UC San Diego's Division of Biological Sciences, which has been recognized for graduating more women in STEM fields than the national average, far more. Now, prior to her current role as divisional dean, she served in several leadership roles for both the academic senate and also the administration, and she is a co-founder of a biotech company focused on antibacterial drug delivery. So now let's hear from Kit about the importance of support she received during her academic journey. As a student, I was really intensely focused on research and intensely curious and really willing to do everything it took to spend as much time as possible in the research lab as soon as I had the opportunity to work there. I was really passionate about understanding how life worked and whatever system I was working on. I just fell in love with genetics and how you could use mathematics to understand how life worked and how living organisms adapted to their environment. And that really took me down this path that led to where I am today. When I was an undergraduate, there were very few female faculty in biological sciences and biochemistry and genetics and any of the departments that I was typically exposed to. And none of those clearly had family. And none of them clearly had the balance in life that I knew would be important for me to be a creative scientist and a leader. My very first research mentor, who was a fabulous human being, but just of a previous generation, told me that I, he was confident that I would have a great career in science if I didn't get married and have a kid. And at the time, I was, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I had, I, you know, getting married, having a family, all I cared about was science. But I still remember thinking, you know, I don't want to do that right now, but I certainly am going to do that in the future because I am confident I can do both if I am truly passionate about what I'm doing. As graduate students, my husband and I decided to start a family. We were two PhD students living in Boston um, and did, had virtually no money, but we remember it as the happiest time of our lives. One of the biggest challenges that my husband and I faced in our academic careers was uh, when I was an assistant professor and he was still a postdoc and our daughter, who was at the time just nine months old, was diagnosed with cancer. And it just felt like we hit a brick wall and like the world was shattering around us. It was really a just a really, it's something no parent ever expects to face. And happily, I didn't have to face that on my own. I had the robust support of my colleagues and the campus as a whole, and that really helped us get through this challenging time. And I'm just deeply grateful for everyone who supported us through that difficult period in our lives. I carry this with me as Dean, because I recognize that my my faculty and our students may be going through challenges like this every day. And it really is uh, my responsibility to pay it forward and to support people who are going through their life challenges to the best of my extent. No one person has the right answer for how to solve any of the problems that the, or challenges the campus faces, nor how to maximize the opportunities that present themselves. But together, we can get to the right answer, especially if we have a diverse group of individuals focusing on the problem and coming together to help find the right solution. So Pradipta, Kit said that we get to the right answer by coming together to find solutions. Now, even though we're bisected by Gilman Drive, UC San Diego is really one university and we excel at multidisciplinary collaboration. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about the importance of collaboration across disciplines and across Gilman Drive and how you include diverse perspectives to advance your research. 
Indeed, uh, uh, happy to take that. So as you know, with your support and the Chancellor's support, I'm really incredibly fortunate to be able to lead what uh, is a large transdisciplinary effort all under one roof, the Institute for Network Medicine. And our vision is to really tackle this vastness of biomedical science with incredible precision. Now, to infuse that precision, we take all that we can from engineering, mathematics, physics, uh, uh, chemistry, all sorts of physical sciences, just to be able to uh, tease out those insights from noisy biology. Let me give you some examples. For example, with my colleague Padmini Rangamani in mechanical and aerospace engineering, we've been working together to tackle some of the most fundamental questions such as how does information transfer from outside of a cell to its interior so that the cell can actually respond to those extracellular cues in a manner that is rapid, is proportionate to the disturbance it feels, and it is in a way that is robust to noise. And some of this work is really beginning to generate new theorems. And we can now compare those bio-inspired theorems with information theory and uh, ask questions such as mutual information in biological systems, how does it work? How, how can we go from there to, you know, how does information transfer in noisy systems? Um, similarly, if you just um, think of our other initiatives, such as drug discovery program, it begins with uh, my colleague, Debashi Sahu in computer science engineering, who is sifting through huge amounts of big data with just a few clicks of the mouse, just because he has built this incredible uh, blueprint for drug discovery, but where the precision in tar picking targets is made with a completely different approach something that nobody else is using right now. And then we run over to the other side and go and uh, uh, go to Jerry Yang in chemistry. And we request him to design these very rational drugs to engage those targets. And then we run back on the other side of Gilman Drive, back to our stem cell biologists who are reverse engineering these model systems, little tiny human organs in a dish so that we can test those drugs on those uh, systems and look for efficacy, toxicity, so on and so forth. So as you can see, we thrive on this culture of convergence. But the Gilman Drive exists geographically, but really we've been able to just walk past across it all over the place. And uh, this, this has been really, really proven instrumental in making progress that otherwise no individual team could have ever imagined that we would be able to do. That's, that's really um, wonderful to hear about. I now have this vision of you and your team of collaborators running from lab to lab together to, uh, to bring all the pieces together, which is, uh, which is tremendously exciting. Let me um, now ask Anika uh, along a similar line of thinking around diverse perspectives, Maybe you could share a bit about the intersection of your scientific curiosity and art and insights gleaned from uh, immersive experiences with other cultures. Absolutely, I'd love to. So it's interesting because for many people, when they first hear of these disparate fields, they're, they're really curious about what connects them. But for me, these fields are sort of like different toolkits for understanding the realities of our inner and outer worlds. I'm an inherently curious person and I love to advance my understanding of different kinds of knowledge. So for example, science is my favorite toolkit for gaining a better grasp of objective knowledge. Whereas art making for me is a toolkit where I can kind of access more kind, I can access subjective knowledge. And in terms of working with other cultures, um, that's a way that I can learn more about embodied knowledge. And so I think it's really interesting because there is actually a lot of existing crosstalk between these different toolkits for understanding the world. Um, and so a lot of my work has been very experimental in terms of thinking cross-disciplinarily about, you know, how do we, how do we take the underlying philosophies of how we create knowledge and validate knowledge and produce knowledge in these different fields? Um, and how do we use these 
different toolkits to tackle pressing health or environmental inequity issues. So one example of how I've been um, kind of trying to combine them recently is through my graduate work um, as a master's student at the MIT Media Lab. So I'm currently in Dr. Kevin Asvelt's lab, Sculpting Evolution, and uh, we've been having a really fascinating and enriching time collaborating with indigenous uh, Maori community leaders in New Zealand or Aotearoa to shape emerging gene editing technologies in the wild. And so I think this is a really exciting project because it, it kind of relates to this theme of, you know, women in STEM or underrepresented groups in STEM, because I think it's not just about the inclusion of, you know, these diverse peoples into these spaces, but taking the next step of thinking about how do we create new systems that allow for these different kinds of knowledge to surface and actually shape, um, you know, future biotechnologies that will likely impact uh, global health and, and environmental justice for the future. Um, and so in terms of art making and how that plays a role in it, so because so much uh, indigenous eco ecological knowledge lives in stories and songs and cultural practices. Um, I love to use art and storytelling, so documentary filmmaking to sort of capture the knowledge that lives in these stories and think about, you know, how can we glean uh, this very different kind of knowledge living in stories with the knowledge set uh, that we see in, you know, in typical Western science. And so with these broad cross-cultural perspectives, we're asking broader questions like, you know, should this technology even exist? what might the impacts look like hundreds of years down the road. And so to kind of answer your final question about what, how a, how a creative mindset might bring an additional perspective to the process of discovery, um, I think what I love the most about uh, my cross-disciplinary training is that all of these different fields uh, have a core focus on questioning. Um, and so especially I think in art, we think a lot about you know, how do we use the senses and different materials to convey a, to convey a message or to construct a new reality for people? Um, and so I think that's a really interesting way of thinking. And when I bring that to my scientific work or, you know, bring a scientific lens to my artistic work, there's a lot of really exciting new ways to imagine the future that we can build. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really tremendous. I love the way that you're looking from so many perspectives at what are the right questions to be asking and how can we work with others from uh, a really, um, from a variety of cultures to think about what are the relevant questions? How do we get together to the answers? How do we even know when we found an answer? So tremendously exciting. And as I think we're, we're picking up on from some of, the, some of the things that you've just said, the path to discovery isn't always a straight line. On the other hand, tenacity will get you there eventually. So let's hear a bit more about Michelle's journey. For 17 years, I lived on a boat out of Oceanside Harbor here in San Diego. Living on a sailboat definitely was a big part of the experience of what made me appreciate efficiencies. I enjoyed propagating by wind or utilizing solar energy for power catching fish, and in general, being in tune with the nature around me, including the weather, the wind, the sun. Although the conditions are ever-changing, you can actually predict certain patterns of certain cycles. I really appreciated getting to live with the circadian day. So the day that I got a traumatic brain injury, I was in a professional surfing competition. I remember surfing a wave and then the next moment I'm in a hospital. I had this pounding headache and I was so confused and so in pain and from there on I tried to return to school but I wasn't the same person I was when I paddled out that day. Some days were definitely harder than others. Some days I felt like I was getting worse instead of getting better. I felt as if all these things that made me, me being a engineer, a student, a surfer, a sailor, I felt as if they were all taken away from me. 
that I was less than what I was before. Although there were times that were frustrating, I always tried to take steps forward and remember what life could be like. Trying to stay optimistic and appreciate the things that I could still do and acknowledge that maybe I would lose some things that I wouldn't be able to get back, but it was still a pleasure to have had them at one point and to have experienced life that way. The learning opportunities at UC San Diego are quite unique. We have facilities that provide a lot of technologies and different types of characterization techniques that can only be found really here in very few places in the world. I find this very beneficial as a student because I'm able to learn from every single one of them different perceptions that actually integrate together into a whole to become a more wholesome engineer. I believe that the future of engineering and technology has a lot to do with being in harmony with nature. For example, biomimicry, biomimetics, is a strategy that we use in order to learn from nature and create more efficient systems that will use less energy, that will be less toxic in the environment, and to overall have better functions that are multiple functions. One structure can do many things. For some others, they might not be able to do everything that they once were able to do. And I feel that in certain ways, I still have post-concussion syndrome symptoms that I have learned to adapt in order to be able to do the things that I want to do. Being myself is just trying my best to be my highest self, to always work towards progression, living in the moment, and adapting to it, just like the cycle of the tides or the patterns of the wind. You yourself are a development of design that is iterating over time. So Olivia, what are the other parts of your identity that you bring to your work? And how does your sense of who you are intersect with the work you do? And beyond that, how are you evolving personally and in the context of your work? I am uh, I'm very definitely a binational person. I was born and raised in Tijuana, right across the border from San Diego. And I did my undergraduate degree at UC San Diego. And so uh, I have I have this, this commitment to both sides of the border that defines in so many ways the things that I do as part of both my research and my educational efforts as a professor in, uh, in the School of Engineering. Uh, so for example, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to join both sides of the border because when I was young, there were, there were really no programs in the sciences and engineering that that brought together young people from Baja California and from, I'm from Southern California. Uh, and, and I think that I missed that when I was a student. I, I wish that that had been available and it wasn't. So when I became a professor, I decided that that, that was going to define my own contribution to, to a place like UC San Diego. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I'm thinking about building bridges of collaboration between both sides of the border. And I do that in my own research. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about who I can collaborate with and what way can we enrich each other's uh, research experiences. So I have lots of collaborations with Mexico and with other parts of the world as well. But I, I think deeply about uh, Mexico and that connection. And in the education side, definitely there's a lot of contribution and thinking and deep, and deep connections that have to do with bringing young, young people together. And uh, that, that connects also to who I am as a person. Uh, my own experience as, as in, in junior high and in high school and then in college at UC San Diego was that I made these deep friendships that have marked my life. Uh, friendships that I still have. Uh, my group of friends from high school is still my group of friends. Uh, and 
I, and when I think about my own life experiences and my friends and my friendships and the way that it has defined me, then I would hope that um, I can do the same for the students now. Um, and so that means for me, bringing students in together, say for example, for a summer experience uh, from the US and students from Mexico and get them to interact and get them to collaborate and get them to engage in research together. So I have one particular summer program that does that uh, very well. And my hope is that those students will become friends. Um, when you have friends, when the friends that you make when you are 17 years old or 18 years old are going to be the friends that you're going to have for the rest of your life. And they are your friends because they are honest friendships, the purest friendships you will ever have. They are based on the fact that you like each other. And so this connection and this building bridges um, across the two sides of the border is, is what has definitely defined me. So that's tremendous. And I love that image of the um, both of you looking at what you uh, maybe thought was a bit missing from some of the, some of the uh, educational experiences early in your life and using building off of that to how to make things better for others but then also reflecting on what has been so rich and important about those friendships and also helping try to build that for others. So maybe to try to um, build off of that in a slightly different direction, I'm gonna go to Kit. Um, Kit, you and I both have um, spouses who are in the same field as each of us are. Um, how has having a life partner in the same field impacted some of the work that you do as a scientist and an educator? Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a, that's a great question. So um, having a partner, my life partner, be a scientist in the same field as me has been a, just a, a huge advantage and a lot of fun in my life as a scientist. Um, we talk about each other's projects and we inspire and challenge one another. And that allows us to take our science really to the next level. I think that is it a huge advantage, especially because we, we are a true partnership in everything we do. So we raise our family together. We work hard and to share that burden very equally. And he's a fabulous partner in that and in science as well. Um, we literally do just about everything together. We also have uh, taught classes together for years. We co-taught the phage genomics research course, which is a research-based undergraduate course. And I like to think that having a a life partner as my co-instructor for that course also was really had a positive impact on the students because this is a research-based course. And I think as everyone knows, biological research doesn't always work no matter how times, how many times you get things honed. So it should work in the classroom. You're doing real research. And sometimes, you know, they're just not going to find that bacterial virus that they're looking for. And so here we had two instructors in front of the class trying to figure out why something didn't work and what we should do to fix it. And we were able to model how to respectfully, uh, but passionately disagree with one another about what the right solution was and what was going on and how we could explain this bizarre phenomenon. And of course, that's how science works when it's at its best. Uh, but I, I think all too often our students don't get to experience that. And so I feel like that was a real advantage for us as well and hopefully for our students. Um, we love I, that I can course. Yeah, I can. I can imagine. I, I can really relate to that. Um, my husband and I have co-taught for many years. We're actually looking forward to co-teaching a, a, a seminar again this uh, this spring. Um, and yes, it adds definitely a real richness to life. That being able to argue at any time of the day about all of these things that you that you have in common and are. Um, you know, from your science to your teaching to whatever's going on in the world. So um, I'd like to now take us uh, back to Olivia. Olivia works really hard to create opportunities and lifelong connections for the next generation of scientists. So let's learn more about that. What I want people to know about me is that I believe very strongly in the concept of si se puede. 
That is the attitude that I bring to my everyday life. The attitude of it can be done and we can do it together. UC Sandeo has been absolutely essential in my career. I mean, I did my undergraduate degree at UC San Diego. I had a wonderful time as an undergraduate at UCSD. Uh, the experience was outstanding. I never thought that I would be a professor. I had never even recognized myself as a, as a professor. I didn't understand what the job entailed. I didn't know anything about that type of career. And Professor Joanna McKittrick showed me what it means to be a professor and she furthermore showed me how to be a female professor. What I do now as a, as a researcher is I work on materials for extreme environments. And if you think about where those materials would be used, we're thinking going to the moon and going to Mars and starting to build the materials that would allow us to make that happen. I am very proud of the technologies that we're developing in my own laboratory, but I'm also proud of the contributions that our campus is making to the education of students. There's a variety of programs and educational innovations that allow our campus to open its doors to other students that are not necessarily just our own students. I do have a goal in life. My goal is to get rid of the border. And I have started a lot of programs that hopefully will make that happen. It goes back to my own friendships as a young person in, in high school and even be, before that, where those are the most honest, truest friendships you will ever have in your whole life because they are based on the fact that you like each other. And that's the only reason you're friends. You just like each other. And I see my summer program as an opportunity for students from both sides of the border to connect with each other and to become friends. And I would imagine a future president of Mexico and a future president of the United States from among students in my program. And you would have known each other since you were 17 years old. That destroys borders. That eliminates walls. So Michelle, much as borders can serve as obstacles to collaboration, we've all faced dif different obstacles or challenges in our careers, in our research, in our personal lives. But as Olivia has just told us, it can be done. Maybe you could tell us something about the importance of adapting in the face of challenges. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, adapting in the face of challenge is a very important lifelong skill. Um, as obstacles are inevitable in our life, um, actually turning these problems into opportunities provide us with more insight in order to gain in our perception. Um, this type of adaption actually allows to strengthen this perception in order to be able to come at whatever comes next in our lives, which are inevitable with these challenges. Yeah, I think, I think that that's absolutely true. It's, since it's inevitable, it's such, so important that we, that we really learn how to adapt and how to deal with these things. So let me, let me build on that with a question to Anika. Um, then how can we make it easier for women and other underrepresented individuals to be, to be truly fearless in pursuing whatever path they may want to pursue? Okay, unmuted now. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Sorry about that. But I think the most important action that we can take uh, to really support women and other underrepresented groups in you know, STEM or really any other field they're passionate about pursuing is to change norms in education to focus on experiential learning. I think in STEM particularly, sometimes it can feel difficult for students from underrepresented backgrounds to feel like 
they have um, a way of contributing back in service uh, of the community that they come from. I think this especially holds true um, when a lot of folks sometimes work in fields like basic, basic science research or um, fields that tend to be a little bit more abstract. Um, because I think sometimes it does create a little bit of inner conflict um, for, for many of these students where you know, they feel happy that they have the opportunity to you know, pursue this exciting career opportunity, but then they'll think, you know, how does this kind of connect back to uplifting the community that I come from? Um, and of course we see really exciting projects come out of that desire, uh, such as what Professor Graves kind of just talked about in terms of the really new exciting uh, collaborations she's been building across the border. Um, but I think in terms of, um, you know, having, having seed funding or having different ways in the classroom um, to allow that space for, for people from underrepresented groups to involve their identity and, you know, involve the place that they're from directly into their work. I think that's something that's very powerful because ultimately I think that is oftentimes a driving source of passion for a lot of these students. I know it is for me personally. And so um, I just wanna share a quick story uh, that I think visualizes this really well. So when I was a senior at UC San Diego, um, I was thinking about doing an honors thesis. And at the time I was also minoring in art and I was thinking, oh, should I try to do two different theses or should I try to weave something together? Um, and so I got a really exciting opportunity to do my thesis uh, in Dr. Rob Knight's lab um, on microbiome research. And so there came a point in time where I was thinking about, for a while I really wanted to find a way to combine um, my interest in art and women's health uh, with the, the urinary microbiome and do a project about that. But I remember in the beginning stages of the project, I put a lot of pressure on myself where I was thinking, you know, maybe I should just make this a purely bioinformatics project because, you know, there are so few women who, who are, you know, really prominent in that field of bioinformatics. And I realized at the point though, that my thinking was being shaped by, you know, the, the landscape of, are there enough women in this field rather than what are, what are actually my passions and my interests? What do I care about more? And so, um, I think that that is sort of a more nuanced look to in terms of what this phrase woman in STEM means, because I think sometimes it is quite empowering, but at other times I think it can also put these different kinds of societal pressures on women to, you know, in a way that shapes our decision making. Um, and so ultimately I decided to go with my original idea and I was really happy because um, I ended up making this really cool art exhibition that um, kind of combined microbiome data about the urinary microbiome with uh, patient perspectives about women's health equity um, and a collaboration with the Student Health Center to kind of create this cross-disciplinary project that really hit all of my passions of, you know, doing science, advancing health equity, and making art. I think that's really a very powerful um, point that you're making here about how we have to give students space to connect what they are passionate about to their education, because that's what's really gonna make them feel welcome to bring their full intellect and their full selves and really deeply connect. And then they'll be able to in turn create and, and do so much more. Um, so, well, you are tireless in pursuing additional perspectives and insights in whatever you do. And so we're gonna take a further look now. I love to just expose myself to new places, new people, new worlds, new ideas. I'll take a walk in a place that I've never been to before. And I feel like if I just go outside and listen and open myself, I'll be inspired by everything that's happening around me. I'm constantly thankful. It is unconventional to be able to be able to travel to so many different places. And the fact that I got to live with an indigenous community for a year, the fact that I got to protest with them for three months and we won a case from the EPA. I'm very fortunate that my life has been such an adventure and I've been able to grow in so many of these different contexts. But at the same time, my life hasn't been without challenges. I've been in scenarios where I was made to feel like I didn't belong because of my gender and because of the color of my skin. I've been told before by a professor 
that I'm not just a pretty face and that to prove I'm not just a pretty face, I should stay overtime and clean up the rest of the lab. I've also had to live with the consequences of fear in terms of not knowing what to do. Uh, you know, should I speak up? Should I not speak up? Should I put my career on the line? Especially when you're young, it's so hard to kind of battle with a lot of these questions. For me to go through that experience, I did mature and I did grow and learn how to deal with these kinds of just respectful attitudes from other people. And it was through that process that I ultimately became stronger in the face of adversity. Something that's been important and valuable for me is having these mentors who care about who I am as a person um, and continue to support me and my personal growth, regardless of what career choice I make or what academic discipline I'd like to go into. Uh, growing up, I often felt a lot of pressure because you know, I am, quote unquote, a successful woman in STEM in terms of, um, you know, I've been able to publish papers and make certain scientific advancements on things. Um, and so over the years, that term woman in STEM has been a really complicated term for me because sometimes it's a term that I'm proud of. It's like, you know, I made it here and I have a right to be here. But other times I feel like it can be limiting because Sometimes I see myself as, you know, going more into the arts or humanities. And what about just encouraging people to pursue their passions? If you are a woman who is in a STEM field right now, you know, there, there might be a point where you sometimes feel like you have a strange relationship with this phase because you're here just for the sake of quote unquote inclusion. But, you know, are there really systems in place to make sure that your voice is heard and that your ideas are being registered. And so I think that's something that I, I hope to sort of shed light on because I know when we, sometimes when we talk about this phrase woman in, in STEM, it's done in a very, an overtly positive light, but I think it's a very nuanced term. For all of us, uh, you know, part of the journey of being human is this process of questioning. You know, I think sometimes we're told this myth of when, when you're an adult, you'll just know everything, you know, everything's going to be smooth and everything has a black and white answer. And I think we can all say that, you know, that's not true. Going off this, this realization that life is always a journey and, you know, all of us are just sort of always still figuring it out in some way or another. I think it's always really powerful to just reflect back on, you know, what did I learn in the past six months? How did, how did I change in the past six months or the past year or the past five years? Um, and it's kind of only when we start to bring up this measuring stick to our, our to ourselves and our personal experiences that, you know, we can start to, to understand and track growth. Olivia, in the video, Anika offered some really good perspective on the topic of women in STEM as being very nuanced. And her point about having systems in place to ensure diverse voices are heard is well made. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the importance of, of support, specifically the impact of mentors on your success and that of others who may be underrepresented in this field. I think that um, that's an excellent question that, that moves us uh, towards, towards what students may be needing from us at this point in time. I certainly had uh, a lot of mentors that helped me along the way. And uh, I think the recommendation to students in general, when they ask me this question about mentors and guidance is that it can't just be one. It, you're going to have a variety of mentors. You, you need to look for guidance in a variety of places. And when you find uh, all these perspectives that can allow you to move forward, that's when you're going to have some success or a lot of success. So in my case, uh, there were a lot of both men and women that helped me in my career. Uh, it, as an undergraduate at UC San Diego, I did work for a, a woman professor uh, that uh, showed me what it meant to be a researcher. Uh, in, and showed me what it meant to be successful as a faculty member, as a professor. So I took her example, and then it became something that now is like, oh, yeah, okay, I can do this. Um, one of the things that I didn't see when I was an undergraduate at UCSD is, is more Hispanics, more Latinos 
uh, in, um, in the classroom, uh, not just at the student level, but also at the faculty level. And so finding those now, because, uh, because UC San Diego is putting in an effort to, to do this, and we are soon to become a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, when we think about those faculty and those students, it, it's about finding them. You know, sometimes a mentor seems like a, a, a daunting thing because maybe you think a mentor is like an 80 year old person that's going to help you. And you know, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, some mentors are gonna be older than you because they have more life experiences that they can share with you. But your friendships, your friends, people of your same age, they can also be mentors. And you're not going to get everything you need from only one person. I mentioned this already. You need to find a variety of mentors. Maybe some of them are going to allow you to explore your interests in science, or some of them are going to allow you to become better students in the classroom. Uh, and some of them are going to allow you to ponder life and make good choices. And so uh, it's not one person and it's not somebody older than you. It's a variety of people. I had that. I was lucky to be able to find those people to help me along the way. It included both Professor Joanna McKittrick, who I did undergraduate research with here at UCSD, as I mentioned already, but also my own PhD advisor, who was a wonderful man. And then so on and so forth, all kinds of people that care. And so when I think about my own role as a mentor, and, and when I get asked, are you a mentor? Do you think you're a mentor? The answer is yes, absolutely. Are you a role model? Yes, I am a role model. It's not boasting. It's realizing that you occupy a place where you can have a positive impact on other people. And so it's about saying, yes, I, I, I can do this, own it own it and then go do something about it. And so I mentioned this because I've, I've gotten comments from students, from young students, women students that say, oh no, I, I, I'm, I don't know, you know, I, I have barely figured out my own life. I don't think I can help others. And the answer is yes, you can. You are in my own field, you are an engineer, you are a student in engineering, you are a female in engineering. Of course, you're a role model. Of course, you're a mentor, own it and go do something about it to help others. So the concept of compassion is very important to me. I learned compassion from my own mentors and I continue to learn about compassion with my own mentors. I would hope that in my own role as mentor and role model, I can also show students how to be compassionate and how to be responsive. Absolutely, I think that that's so very important. There's always a way that each person can be a mentor and role model to one another. There are always things that we can learn from one another, as you're saying. Um, let, me, let me take this in a slightly different direction. Um, Kit, I, I heard you jokingly describe yourself as a, a tour guide in your choice of research topics. Um, what do you mean by this? And does this also apply in maybe other areas of your career as a woman in STEM? Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I think we've all had the experience of visiting an important historic or cultural site and having a tour bus pull up and the, before everybody gets off the tour bus, the tour guides run out there with their little flags and and there's always one tour guide that goes and stands off, uh, goes away from all the crowds and goes and stands off in the middle of an empty field and plants their flag in the field and hopes that people will come over and see what it is that they've found that people find interesting. And so um, as a scientist, I really have always tried to avoid the crowds and kind of set my own direction and hope that the people on the bus trust me and know that if I stand there with my flag that I found something interesting, that they'll wanna come over and see what it is that I'm gonna tell them about. And so I think that uh, captures my role, you know, as a scientist and my approach to science, never really, never following the crowds and trying to explain what I'm doing and why it's interesting. I think that's critically important in leadership also. You want people to know that you might have something interesting to say and maybe wanna hear from you on specific topics. And I think it's also really important as a women in leadership in STEM, just to be there um, in this field that uh, until recently didn't have so many women in leadership positions 
just to show people that, yes, this is a place where you too can come and you can be a leader in STEM. You can make your own way in this field and do it according to your own guidelines. You don't have to follow people. You can be the pioneer as a leader in STEM and as a scientist. Thank you. I think, I think that's a really interesting point. And I'd like to maybe tie together a little bit what you just said and what Olivia said um, in the sense that sometimes somebody can act as a leader by acting as a mentor across difference. Being a mentor maybe an, or, or, or an ally in some unexpected ways. And um, I have an example of it from, from my own past. I mentioned um, in, in my video, um, my thesis advisor, Howard Georgi, who was also my postdoctoral advisor as it happened. And um, uh, so when I was a postdoc, um, uh, my husband and I were expecting our first child. And when I, when I told Howard, even though I'd known him for years, I was just a little worried because many people way back <laughs> that, those many years ago um, had horrible stories about how uh, people weren't so supportive when, when a woman scientist would say that, that she was expecting. Well, Howard was so thrilled, he went out and bought a playpen and put it in his office. And he said, uh, now when you're, I want you to bring the baby so I can watch the, watch the baby. And so my husband and I couldn't afford a babysitter five days a week. We each took a couple days a week that we were home with the baby. So on my days with the baby, I would go in and put the baby down for a nap in the playpen in my advisor's office. I'd go talk with my collaborators, come back an hour later. And usually by then the baby was up and Howard would have the baby up on his shoulder and be doing you know, the baby dance while talking with some other people about physics. And that, I've never heard of anybody who had, has this story. He was, he helped me so much by just being himself and in this unconventional way, being an ally and supporter to me. And so I've tried to find ways, just always remember, remembering that, to try to be maybe an ally or supporter to groups who um, were having a tough time in physics, working, for example, with the um, LGBTQ community in physics and trying to be supportive and um, understand um, what that group has been uh, encountering. We did a whole climate survey for the American Physical Society and, and, and various things. And I found, you know, I learned so much by working with that community. And I think perhaps it gave me um, um, a little more compassion as uh, Olivia was saying, and a little bit more humility about things I didn't know about how to be a good ally at first. Um, to that community, and then one, that one has to keep trying. But I think in the end, it taught me some important lessons for leadership, as, as you've said, Kit. So maybe turning to Michelle now, maybe, maybe Michelle, you could tell us who has helped you achieve your full potential, and how are you helping your students and your colleagues achieve their full potential? So other than the support of the role models that I had growing up as my parents for being very strong and diverse individuals. Um, there are a couple of factors at UC San Diego that have really helped me gain to my um, most full potential, at least to where I am at now. Um, first off, I'd like to bring up um, the interdisciplinary staff of both females and males of the nanoengineering department. Um, this interdisciplinary staff has actually helped um, create this like more broad perspective on um, a lot of different points of view, but of very similar topics of the nanosciences. But another factor of some very important mentors to me at UC San Diego are from being a fellow for the Global Ties program. Um, I mm -hmm. have gotten the pleasure to work under Dr. Mandy Bratton, as well as Barbara Donovan, who have been very strong role models as um, leaders, to be exact. They've taught me a lot about effective communication, about um, collaborative responsibility, um, resolving conflict, as well as trust. And these are values that I give off also and help mentor with my students that I work as a development of design for engineering instructor. And so 
I want to say thank you to all of those people. And that's tremendous that you clearly have this very strong kind of mentoring network that Olivia was talking about with us earlier. So that's wonderful to see how that's working out uh, for you in, in, uh, in particular. Um, now, Predicto's work is an excellent example of the importance and value of a multidisciplinary perspective. So let's hear a bit more about that now in the video. This is an incredibly fulfilled life. I took not one, but two different careers. And as a physician scientist, there were far too often instances where I'm trying to do an endoscopy and my clinical colleague would be telling me, Pradeepta, try to be a real clinician. So I'm not a real clinician somehow. And then I would enter the lab and my uh, peers would tell me, be a real researcher you know, like the PhDs in the lab. So I, I, I realized that I have chosen this path where I'm going to hear from both sides of this spectrum. I'm in the middle and I can talk the best of both worlds. I do fundamental basic research, just like a lot of my PhD colleagues. But when I see my patients, my patients see in me an MD doctor who has their best interest in their mind. My journey has been uh, non-conventional. Just look at me. I am a foreign medical graduate from India. As a student, I was curious. I was driven. I was the only student who went through entire medical school without buying a single book. I'm a visual learner. And once I've looked at something, it's impossible to forget. And because of that reason, I pour every effort that I can in making best images, whether it is in my manuscripts, whether it is an article I'm writing, or whether it's a textbook chapter, or whether it is teaching students in classroom. Because I know that there is a good reason why people say a picture is worth a thousand words. In the clinic, there are so many diseases that I see today. I have read about them in my medical school textbooks. We still don't have a cure. Forget cure. If we have tablets that we hand out, most of the time it's a toss of a coin if that particular patient is going to benefit. What we are doing here is to achieve both precision and personalization in medicine. This is what I struggle every day to do in my clinic. I've been increasingly thinking about this question, what legacy am I going to leave? I think of it as two things, people and the product I leave behind. Uh, the, the lives that I get to touch, shape, form their careers, the moment they leave my lab, they're ambassadors of my lab. That is how I see as a piece of me still there after long after I'm gone. The second part is the product in this Institute for Network Medicine. One of those would be the drugs, the biomarkers, the models for research that we leave behind for the other scientists to use. All of these combined together, if they stand the test of time, I would think I've done a good job. If they touch other people's lives, I would think I have left a strong legacy. Pradeepta, I'm sure there's much that you would still like to accomplish as a scientist and also as a physician. Now, I think I heard you say that at the end of the day, it's not about the number of papers you published or the amount of research money you received, so what is it about? What edge are you working toward? And what will your legacy be? Um, you know, growing up, Dr. Simmons, um, I have this uh, recollection in medical school. Uh, I used to get incredibly restless every time I was put in a box. At least my professors would say that I asked too many darn questions. Um, so I, I, by the time I graduated, 
I had this monastic obsession that I refuse to be a physician who's going to spend my entire life just following what the textbooks have written down uh, and I'm told what to do. Instead, I had a different uh, idea. I decided that I'm going to be a part of the force that rewrites those textbooks as to how it should be done, could be done. So that I would say is uh, what was my um, driving force behind anything that I did uh, after finishing medical school. But, uh, you know, uh, it's famously said by um, the Hungarian biochemist, um, Georgi, uh, Georgi, uh, Albert Georgi, uh, uh, and it goes something like, research is to see what everybody else has seen, but think, but what nobody else has thought. Uh, but we have been seeing a lot more. The times have changed. We have so much big data backed by technological, you know, explosion. And so we're seeing more. What are we doing about what we are seeing? So I have a different take on that is in this era of big data where we have exponential growth of what we can see. Maybe we should change that saying and say, see what nobody else has seen by thinking what nobody else has dared to think. And that is when I feel I, I have reached that point uh, at the edge, edge of reason, edge of possibility, edge of um, uh, chaos. And uh, that's where I think patterns would emerge. Um, I think as a physicist, you would, uh, appreciate that patterns emerging at the edge of chaos, chaos theory a little bit in my uh, simplistic way of uh, a drawing analogy. But um, so that would be uh, that. And to come to your third question, uh, legacy. So uh, I've been incredibly fortunate uh, to have had a chance to be mentored by Stuart Kornfeld and Marilyn Farquhar two pioneers in their field, they created two fields, glycobiology by Kornfeld and again, cell biology, uh, quote unquote, the mother of cell biology, Marilyn Parkour. So, you know, for, I, I realized that yes, two things that are important to leave behind as legacy, of course, the work, and so um, I've always been told that work that stands the test of time, not just any work. So that would be uh, one. But then people, people that we get to uh, impact as mentors. And because I was so fortunate where both my mentors really had, they were on one fine day, they're a coach. Another fine day, they're a friend. Another fine day, they're my um, a colleague, um, a teacher, instructor. Most days, they were my mirror. I could see myself. I could recognize myself. I could see what I wanted to be uh, just reflected uh, in them. So uh, I, I, that, is, that is what I think if as a... Uh, if I have to leave behind a legacy, whatever it is that new thing that we are about to do or we are about to stumble into, if that discovery really dies with us, it's really unfortunate. So I, that has to live through and it has to be long lasting. And for that, there has to be a generation of trainees who can take the torch forward. So that's, that's why I feel like... Um, I've been thinking more about it. I don't think the videos or the Zoom catches. There's quite a few gray hairs here. And so I keep thinking more and more about legacy. And now is the perfect time to think about it. And I, I love the way you think about it in terms of the future generations and the, uh, the, the, the people. I'm, I'm going to now take this question to each of our panelists. Um, what edge are you working towards? What's next in the distant future when you look back on your career and your research and accomplishments? What will your legacy be? And so I'll go to each of you in turn. Um, Olivia? So on the research side, 
I work on materials in extreme environments. That's my area of research. And what that means is that uh, we develop materials for say ultra high temperatures or ultra low temperatures or extremes of radiation or extremes of impact. And a lot of the work that we do in my lab is uh, related to materials that will eventually allow us to say, for example, build a house in Mars or on the moon. That's pretty extreme in terms of environments. And so uh, I'd like to say that at the end of the day, maybe there are some small contributions that, that have to do with human habitation and uh, participation and discovery of new science in Mars or the moon, or maybe even beyond because of things that happened in my lab uh, at some point. I love chemistry. So a lot of the work that I do is, I'm an engineer, of course, but a lot of the work is chemistry oriented. And I love the periodic table of the elements because if you think about it, I mean, that basically defines everything that the universe is made of. And, um, and so I always tell students that they should buy one, put it in the wall in front of their bed. And so when they wake up in the morning and they look up, that's the very first thing that they should see. And then it's like, wow, that's what the universe is made of. And so that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect that is equally important is that I want to uh, tear down walls. I want to destroy the border. I want to bring down the border between the US and Mexico. Maybe that can be an inspiration for other borders. But I'd, I'd like to think that, that with the activities that we're doing now in my lab and in the outreach uh, that, that we work with, eventually there will be no wall. And that is my wall. Before I die, I'd like to not see a border in between San Diego that's, and Tijuana for starters. That's, that's tremendous. That's very inspiring. Let me go now to Anika. So when I think about, you know, what's next for me in the near future, so I'm graduating uh, from the MIT Media Lab with my master's this year, and I'm hoping to start medical school um, in the coming year. And so I think for me, I've just been really blessed to have a lot of different life experiences and learn from a lot of different people around the world. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with migrants at the US-Mexico border, uh, refugees in South Asia, indigenous people across the Pacific Islands in Asia. And, you know, through this process of working with so many, you know, culturally diverse groups of people, um, you know, learning about their, their different ways of understanding uh, the health of, of humans, the health of the ecosystem, the environment, the ways that these are all intertwined in different ways, um, and also the realities of, of um, health inequity and environmental inequity in all of these places um, has really kind of pushed me to this point where, um, you know, I, I want to begin being in service to these people. I want to slowly kind of transition, I think, out of academic institutions and sort of more into being in the community and finding ways to do uh, capacity building with a lot of these under, underserved communities, finding ways to build, um, help people build institutions that kind of answer their own their own community's needs. I think there is still this paradigm um, in research where I think, especially in terms of addressing social inequities or health and health or environmental inequity, um, we often see the researcher at the academic institution as you know, having, having the capital on knowledge and, you know, knowing the answer, but I'd like to sort of shift it more towards a paradigm of, you know, everyone has, has knowledge that is relevant in some way. How do we find ways to weave these different kinds of knowledge together um, to really, you know, create innovative ways of approaching these really difficult issues? Because I think on one hand, um, you know, nothing can, can really replace lived experience. Uh, and, you know, that comes from people who live in these places and have to go through the day to day of uh, a lot of these issues versus, you know, having access to uh, 
tools and, and resources to kind of answer these questions in different ways. So that's something I'm sort of moving towards. And I think conceptually, um, I've also been thinking a lot about global health and the way that we currently approach global health is um, sort of based mostly around different kinds of disease incidents, like non-communicable disease. But recently, I've been thinking a lot about uh, labor and health. So, you know, especially with the rise of industrialization around the world, um, just the way that we have created entire new systems of labor, uh, and a lot of that labor, you know, is is mostly in the global south and it has specific impacts on the environment and health of those communities. Um, and so this is a really, really different way of thinking about global health. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very complicated, but that's where I really want to draw upon my artistic skills in, in filmmaking um, and in performance. And I want to try to sort of paint a picture of this, of this different world I see and then, you know, use cross-disciplinary research to kind of tease out, tease out some ways to address those problems. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately in terms of my legacy, um, I think the most powerful thing I can do while I'm on this planet is, you know, enable other people to imagine, imagine their own worlds, imagine their own futures. Um, I think that's the most powerful impact that I can have. Well, that's a very exciting vision. It's, it's also tearing down borders in a way. And it's, um, that's, yeah, that is very exciting. Let me go now to Michelle. So in regards to where I see myself going in the near and distant future as well, um, has a lot to do with continuity. Um, I would like to, just as in nanoengineering, where it's continuity between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics from nanoscale to macro scale, I want to provide continuity um, between people and interconnectedness um, in regards to teaching science to an informal audience, for example. Um, I would like to also provide continuity um, between different people as well as from like man as in humans to nature. And so that's where I see my future going is in continuity. Also a really inspiring concept. Kit? Thank you. Uh, so as a scientist, I am obsessed with breaking down technological barriers to discovery in the biological sciences. So I like to find new ways to genetically engineer cells or to use equipment to reveal the inner workings of cells. And as Dean, I have um, really the, the great pleasure of helping to help others and a, to build a place in the division of biological sciences where others can break down technological barriers. This is really my obsession, both as a scientist and as a dean, break down technological barriers to redefine what is possible in biological sciences to drive discovery and innovation so that our foundational research in biological sciences can really form the basis for new treatments and new applications to improve human health and, and the environment moving forward. I'm also really um, obsessed um, as well with breaking down the barriers to success for all of our students in the Division of Biological Sciences. We have the most diverse um, biological sciences student body and it's my job as Dean and my pleasure to find ways to help them grow to be leaders in their chosen field, whatever that may be, and um, to help ensure that they have all the tools that they need to succeed in their careers. And I hope that my legacy will be um, in the accomplishments of my faculty and my students. And I hope that the division will be recognized as a place where innovation really thrives and where our students, when they go on the job market, people look and say, you know, that person's from UC San Diego, I should really take another look at that CV because they must be terrific because that campus is doing many things right. Um, I hope that'll be my legacy. So thank you very much for the question. Well, I think, I think that would be a, a fabulous legacy in, in, in many ways. Now we had quite a number of questions um, submitted by, by various um, 
people who are who are listening in today. Um, and we won't be able to get to all of them, but let's try to get to a few of them. Uh, I'd like to go to a quick lightning round question submitted by Liz. Um, uh, let me ask, uh, what are you reading or listening to for inspiration right now? Any um, uh, particular podcasts or blogs or publications, um, Pradeepta? Um, well, uh, yeah, there's nothing uh, that is as good as uh, this feed that comes into my Facebook um, thread. It's called Power of Positivity. Uh, I can hmm. tell you that... Uh, I think it was founded in 2009, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a new slash web platform that sends out these incredible quotes. And uh, uh, once it's shared, if, it's, if you have a tremendous number of positive-minded uh, people in your network, you're going to see it, and you're going to get hit by these quotes. So that has been uh, something that's a five-minute break, but those quotes really helped me out a lot. And the rest of the time, I think... My entire lab knows what gets predicted through a tough day. Show her the data. And so I, I kid you not that they know exactly which button works on me. So uh, yeah, those, those are some, uh, some of the ways. That's, that's terrific. Um, uh, Michelle, how about you? Um, a really inspiring uh, podcast that I listened to is called The Moth. Um, it's about personal stories, usually overcoming adverse experiences in life. It, you get to see other people's perceptions on how they turned a lot of these problems into opportunities in their daily lives. And um, that has really inspired me to overcome certain challenges that I've had personally. And I think that it would be beneficial for others that are also seeking kind of like a more intimate experience, but in a podcast type of format. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Olivia? Two things, actually. Uh, the first one is I'm reading for about the 20th time uh, one of the biographies written by uh, for, of, of Eleanor Roosevelt, who is amazing, and he, who used to say that nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. And I totally believe in that, right? It, it is like, you know, Anyone that tries to make you feel less, they should not, they do not have your consent. And so, yes, that's one. And then the second one is just today I received in the mail the April issue of Scientific American and it, I, I gobble it up the moment it arrives. I already started this morning uh, as soon as I got it with a few, a few readings. So those two things are really important to me at the moment. Terrific. Uh, Kit? So I'm really enjoying The Code Breaker, the book about Jennifer Doudna by Walter Isaacson, because um, Jennifer is really, she was, a, she was a classmate of mine and in graduate school, and she's really an inspiration and a great example of someone who has taken, you know, this genetic widget and used it to achieve really great things. And she's a wonderful human being, and it's wonderful to see her succeed and be profiled by an author who has also written about Leonardo da Vinci and Steve Jobs. So that's really an inspiration to me. Excellent. Well, each of you have taken such fascinating and non-conventional journeys to arrive at this point in your careers. It's been a pleasure spending time with you. We've only been able to scratch the surface of your remarkable body of work and your experiences. For our guests who would like to hear more from tonight's esteemed panelists, we're posting longer form video interviews with each of them, and you can find these videos on the 60th anniversary website. Um, thank you, each of our panelists, for sharing your stories with us, and thank you for the example that you set for the next generation of scientists, clinicians, engineers, and researchers. And thank you for showing them what it means to be deeply curious and collaborative and to encourage them to look deep and then look deeper. So it's now my pleasure to return the floor to Chancellor Kosla for some closing remarks. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was so impressive. I was hoping you'd continue for a while more. I was actually enjoying it thoroughly. 
Uh, great panelists, great careers, great stories, and extremely thoughtful comments. Uh, so I really, really appreciate each and every one of you and what you have done. And thank you for being here today. So I also hope that you'll join us to celebrate even more trailblazers who are paving the way for women in our, at our 2021 Women in Leadership virtual event. So this event will, all, will honor Sally Ride and the leadership of Sally Ride. So this year, it also celebrates 20 years of innovation and leadership through Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego, which of course, as you know, provides STEM inspiration for the next generation. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all in April at our next evening of non-conventional, not un, but non-conventional wisdom. And to register, you can go to the website, go to the 60th anniversary website. And with that said, thank you all very much. Have a great evening. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.